All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective as usual. Um, and tonight we're going to continue uh, a little a little series I started uh, sort of at the beginning of the year, and it's a series on upaya. Uh, skillful means or expedient means. And we've been reading, and tonight we will read a little bit from the Upaya Sutra, the, the Sutra on Skillful Means. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, I want to review a little bit of some things that we've talked about in the prior sessions. Um, yeah, so I have a whole kind of... Um, uh, a few different things planned for this evening for us to do. The first thing I want to do, which I I think this might be interesting for some people out there, you might be thinking about this, uh, but it happens to be today, Lunar New Year. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that we'd talk a little bit quickly about that because it, it kind of pertains to Buddhism um, and I'm going to make it pertain to Buddhism. So... Mm -hmm. um, so uh, today, or kind of yesterday in that sense, uh, was the beginning of the, the what is called the Lunar New Year in that way. You might know it as like the uh, Chinese New Year. Um, and so it's interesting because if you know that system, you'll know that today or again yesterday, it began the year of the rabbit. And I want to talk a little bit about the year of the rabbit. We are coming out of, if you didn't know, we're coming out of the year of the tiger. And before that was the year of the ox. And before that, the year of the rodent, which begins the cycle of the 12 animals. So 2020 was the beginning of a whole new cycle. <laughs> and so if 2020 felt like the beginning of a whole new world, it was because it was the beginning of a whole new uh, lunar solar cycle in that way. And the idea, of course, is that the tiger, which was last year, the tiger is sort of a very energetic animal. And so last year, very um, considered to be very kind of fast pace in that sense, a lot of energy. Whereas this year, we're coming into the year of the rabbit or the hare. And the thing about it, so I wanted to use this uh, to talk about tonight's topic. So specifically tonight, we're going to be talking about kashanti, uh, patience, peacefulness, gentleness, kashanti. And of the 12 animals that are in the lunar solar zodiac, the rabbit is considered the most gentle in that way. It's sort of part of one of the characteristics or the qualities of the, the rabbit. And if you didn't know, there are these five elements in the Chinese system, right? Um, earth, water, fire, metal, and wood. And those five elements, the 12 animals cycle through them. And so we are actually entering a water rabbit year. And what they say is, is that the water element is, of course, all by itself, very gentle. And so a water rabbit year is particularly a kind of soft, gentle, uh, that's the, the essence of in that way. Um, so that should be nice. But I reference all of this about the rabbit and the water rabbit and the gentleness of the rabbit, because today, tonight, this evening, we're going to talk about Kashanti, this Buddhist idea, this practice of peacefulness or patience is how it's usually translated, or gentleness. So there's a way in which this year, this coming year of the rabbit, is expected to be rather uh, kashanti in that way, rather peaceful. 
So let's let's hope for the best as far yeah. as that goes. Um, so that's my little segue out from the Lunar New Year into tonight's topic about peacefulness. So the next thing I want to mention is the way that we're going to approach this topic tonight. So I started this series by talking about uh, well, what we're doing is, as you may know, is that we're looking at the six paramitas, these six practices of a bodhisattva. And so we started with the practice of giving. But what I want to do with this series is we are talking not just about giving, or the first night, we didn't talk just about giving. We talked about skillful giving, or expedient giving, or upayak uh, giving in that way. And let me just kind of quickly remind you about that first night. So the idea is, is I think there's a general kind of a, agreed upon sense in the world, not just in the world of Buddhism, but just kind of all around, that I think most people probably would say that being generous or being giving is a good thing. <laughs> like most people I think would agree, they, they may or may not do it, but that it is good to do it. I think a lot of people, a lot of traditions, a lot of cultures would all agree that that's a good thing. And it's a practice of Buddhism and it's a practice of the Bodhisattva. But the idea is you could approach the practice of giving as this kind of, um, you know, it's just sort of like it's something nice. It's something good. It's something good to do. And of course, if you're in a Buddhist environment or if you're in a kind of kind of more traditional Indian environment, there's understood to be some kind of like a, a metaphysics involved in giving right? They call it punya, call it merit. And so the idea is, is not only is it good to be generous and giving, but you even might be getting this kind of uh, metaphysical merit, this kind of punya that's going to help you out in all kinds of ways. So be generous and be giving. That's one way to approach this practice of giving that it is just good and therefore you should do it. But what I talked about in the first night when we kind of uh, started talking about upaya, I, I introduced this idea of, the, of looking at the paramitas, beginning with the first one of giving, but let's look at it from the perspective of wisdom. And what I tried to do in that first session is sort of break down the sort of the psychology of giving versus the psychology of holding on and maybe what uh <clears throat> what habits or what samskara right what conditioned behaviors what what conditioned behaviors are we reinforcing when we are kind of when we are stingy in that way or we're holding on in that way versus what kind of conditioning or habits or what kind of a mind state are we cultivating if we're being generous? And the idea is, or what I was presenting, is that from a kind of bodhisattva point of view, the practice of giving just makes perfect sense it's actually understood to be very wise to do. And I basically explained it as that the Bodhisattva recognizes that being generous is a win-win situation. Both parties, the person who's asking for something and you, the person giving in that way, both parties benefit. Whereas in the other version, we think we're benefiting 
because we're holding on to our money or our stuff or whatever it is. So we might think we're benefiting when we hold on to this, but the Bodhisattva realizes that it is to their great benefit to be generous and it's a benefit to others, whereas the holding on is detrimental to themselves. And of course, it doesn't help out the person who's asking for some help. So it's a lose-lose. <laughs> so the Bodhisattva practices giving out of wisdom and the knowledge that it's a win-win situation in that sense. Likewise, last week we talked about shila, shila, this moral discipline. And in particular, we talked about the five precepts, these five kind of observances of Buddhists in that way. And again, there's one way to approach the precepts, which is that if I'm going to practice Buddhism, if I'm going to practice the Dharma, I should avoid killing, should avoid stealing, should avoid sexual misconduct, I should avoid false speech, and I should avoid intoxication. That's just what I should do. And so there is a way to follow the precepts just as, you know, okay, like I'll do that. But last week, I talked about sort of the wisdom of the precepts. And in the same way, how it might be that the Bodhisattva realizes that being violent, being harmful to other <laughs> creatures might not be the best way. It, again, it might not be very wise to do that. And so with all the rest of the precepts, and so the idea is, is that one, <laughs> the Bodhisattva practices the precepts out of wisdom not necessarily out of a sense of moral obligation in that sense, or a moral imperative again, out of wisdom. And the Bodhisattva in practicing the precepts, and I might not have said this super clearly last week, but in terms of upaya, in terms of skillful means, the, the Bodhisattva would also practice the precepts as a, a way of benefiting others. Even though it might seem like practicing the precepts is only about one's own practice, <laughs> one's own behavior, one's own mind in that way, the Bodhisattva realizes that, again, it's beneficial for all parties involved to follow the precepts, myself and others, and therefore, again, it's a win-win. So... So we're going to approach Kshanti, this idea of patience, the third paramita. We're going to approach that the same way tonight. But I want to begin by actually digressing. And I want to begin by doing a little reading. So what I'm going to read from is I'm going to read from our sutra. So this is the Upaya Sutra. I read from it a little bit the first night, and then I think last uh, Sunday I didn't get back to the sutra. So we've only read a little bit of this. And the basic is, is that there's a bodhisattva named Nyanotada, this supreme high wisdom bodhisattva. And the bodhisattva asks the Buddha, how does a bodhisattva practice upaya? <laughs> That's the question. And what we learned was, and it was the very first part, and it was about when a bodhisattva practices upaya, and it's about when they were, if they were to give a handful of food to any sentient being, even an animal, and it's this idea that when they are doing this, they do it with an aspiration for enlightenment. They do it for an aspiration for all-knowing wisdom. And they vow to share any punya, any merit, any goodness that comes from this giving 
any merit I get, there's a vow to share that with all sentient beings in order to aid their enlightenment. So the bodhisattva, the focus, is on everyone's enlightenment. Whereas in the early form of Buddhism, what we call sometimes the Hinayana, the focus is on what is called individual liberation. The focus is entirely on one's own liberation. What are the things keeping me from being liberated? What are the things I can do to be liberated? And ultimately, when, when am I going to be liberated? <laughs> So it's a focus entirely on individual liberation, whereas the bodhisattva path, the focus is ever, always on universal enlightenment. And they, of course, are not just talking about all the people, they're talking about every sentient being. So... I want to move a little further in the sutra, and I'm going to read a few sections, and I want to read these, and as I read, I, I'm getting to a part that's about kashanti, that's about patience. So I'm the wh what I'm reading, we're going to get there, but the first part of what I'm going to read, it isn't explicitly about patience. It's not explicitly about it, but I want to read it for one reason. So this whole sutra, of course, is about the bodhisattva and about the bodhisattva practicing upaya. And what I want us to focus on as I'm reading is what kind of person is this? Like what kind of a human being or what kind of a, of, an, of, of a being are we hearing about? So like what is, you know, so yeah, we're going to hear about certain practices, but I want to focus on sort of the, the heart of this bodhisattva that we're hearing about. Like what is this kind of person all about, right? So for example... This is the, ne the next paragraph in the sutra after that first one I read uh, a couple weeks ago. So the, the Buddha is talking to this bodhisattva and he says, uh, furthermore, Kulaputra. So Kulaputra is like a noble child, good person. So furthermore, Kulaputra. When bodhisattva mahasattvas practice ingenuity, Practice, sorry, practice upaya, skillful means. And when they see other people practicing giving, they rejoice. They are happy. And they wish to share with all sentient beings the merit of sympathetic joy, mudita, by transferring or dedicating the merit of this empathic sympathetic joy, transferring it to the universal attainment of enlightenment. The bodhisattvas also hope that the givers and the recipients, that they will not be apart from the aspiration for all-knowing wisdom. Even if the recipients happen to be Shravakas from the Hinayana, Pratekya Buddhas, those solitary enlightened ones. So this is another practice of the, para, the upaya of a bodhisattva. So bodhisattvas walking down the street, they see, uh, they see this person give this person something. So they're not even the one doing the giving. They're just witnessing somebody else give something to somebody else. And the bodhisattva is delighted to see such things going on in the world. So 
they have what is called mudita, this empathic joy where they are delighted to see people giving. And then you know what the Bodhisattva does? They take the merit that they themselves have kind of garnered from being joyful at other people giving. They transfer the merit that they might get from that empathic joy. They transfer it to all beings attaining enlightenment, right? Let's hear more about this person. Moreover, Kulaputra, when bodhisattvas who practice upaya see flowers or trees or any kind of incense which does not belong to anyone in any of the worlds of the Ten Directions, they will gather them up and offer them to Buddhas. When they see flowers, trees, or any kind of incense, which once belonged to someone but has now been blown away by the wind, they will gather them up and offer them to the Buddhas in the worlds of the Ten Directions. They cultivate these roots of goodness in order to cause themselves and all other sentient beings to have the aspiration for all-knowing wisdom. Because of this root of goodness, they will achieve immeasurable discipline, meditation, wisdom, liberation, and the knowledge and awareness derived from liberation. This is another of the practices of upaya of a bodhisattva. Oh, look at JJ. Go, JJ. Go, JJ. Go, JJ. Yeah, bro. Thanks. All right. So, <laughs> so now, next up is this idea that a bodhisattva goes around seeing some flowers or some trees or incense that are it's not owned by anyone. They gather it up, they offer it to Buddhas. And then again, whatever merit they might get from such offerings, they transfer it to the liberation of all beings, <laughs> right? So we're sensing a pattern here, right? So furthermore, Kulaputra, when bodhisattvas who practice upaya see sentient beings in any of the worlds of the Ten Directions, enjoying blissful karmic rewards. They think, may all sentient beings attain the bliss of all-knowing wisdom. And when the bodhisattvas see sentient beings in any of the worlds of the Ten Directions suffering from painful karmic retribution, they think, they will, or they, or they themselves will repent for the transgressions of those other people on their behalf. And the bodhisattvas adorn themselves with this great vow. I will undergo all the sufferings of sentient beings in their stead, and I'll make them happy. By this good root, they hope to achieve all-knowing wisdom and to relieve the afflictions of all sentient beings. Because of this, they and all those sentient beings will be completely free from all suffering and can enjoy pure bliss. This is the practice of upaya by bodhisattvas. So now, we see someone reaping good karmic rewards, right? Somebody has put in some hard work, they've been diligent, and it's being rewarded. And they are, whatever it is, they're achieving a goal that they've set forth for themselves. So, or, you know, they've been maybe trying to get into a, a, a get a job or get into a school, and they did it. They worked hard, they got the job, they got into school, so they're reaping good karmic results from their effort. 
the Bodhisattva is delighted for them. And in their delight for people's success, they wish that all beings would enjoy the bliss of all-knowing wisdom. So once again, the Bodhisattva is ever focused on all sentient beings being joyful, becoming enlightened. But then the flip side of this, if a Bodhisattva sees somebody reaping bad karmic results, they haven't been putting in the work. Maybe they've been putting in the wrong work and now life is really handing it to them, right? So they're really getting their karmic comeuppance. The Bodhisattva thinks, my bad, I, I repent for them. I'm going to do it for them. And in fact, let me take the hit. Let me take the karmic retribution for them, right? I will undergo all the sentient being sufferings, the suffering of all sentient beings in their stead and thereby make them happy. Okay, so this one I want to talk a little bit about because this is what, the one that I find so interesting. So this is an interesting approach, which is, and, and now I think we can appreciate the first part of this, the idea of kind of celebrating when other people are getting kind of good karmic rewards. The idea of celebrating that I think we can kind of all understand. But it's this other one where we're seeing people kind of suffer from various reasons from their kind of karmic comeuppance. And this bodhisattva's sort of willingness to step in and take those karmic results for them, right, in their stead. So you hear this a lot. This is, some, this is an aspect of the Bodhisattva path that if you read enough sutras, if you read enough about the Bodhisattva, you'll hear that this is a big part of what makes a Bodhisattva a Bodhisattva. And especially when it is put as, in terms of taking on the suffering of all sentient beings for them, I can't help but be reminded of the Christian myth about someone taking on the suffering of all sentient beings for them. It, it sounds very familiar, right? Now, of course, in the Christian tradition, there was only one person capable of actually doing that, capable of actually taking on the karmic suffering of all sentient beings. And that person had to be the son of God. It was that big of a, of a, of a, of a task. Whereas in the Buddhist tradition, all bodhisattvas are sort of in a way expected to step up to do this exact same thing. Now, I wanna talk really quickly about something very interesting. So I, the way that I read this, the way that I hear this, the way that I understand this, there's kind of two different things going on. And I want to separate those two different things. What I mean is, is that let's say, let's create, I'm going to create a hypothetical scenario. So the hypothetical scenario is that a friend of yours, a relative of yours, maybe even it's somebody you don't even know, but let's just keep it simple. So a friend of yours has really walked down the wrong karmic path repeatedly. And they have actually gotten to the point where they've done something completely terrible and they're, they're going to be punished for it maybe by the state, maybe capitally punished, right? So they're, they're going to get the death penalty for their bad karmic action, right? This is sort of suggesting that the Bodhisattva would say, hey, 
uh, state state of California or whatever state use, has the death penalty, hey, take me instead. I'll, I'll suffer the karmic consequences for my friend here. I, I repent for his uh, bad behavior. Let me, let me go take the death penalty instead, right? The sutra is sort of suggesting that a bodhisattva would do that and wouldn't and would actually do it if you read other sutras a bodhisattva would be willing to do this for any sentient being <clears throat> regardless of whether they know them or not it's just a, a readiness to to do this so one thing is if you were actually in a situation like that where you could substitute yourself for someone and and suffer kind of karmic consequences for them right so one thing is actually doing that okay what i want to talk about though it's what i think is really interesting i want to think about and talk about how we might react to hearing about that. So what I mean is, is if I read that a moment ago, that the Bodhisattva here is willing to repent for those other people's transgressions and on their behalf, they will take on their suffering, right? So if I read that and you think to yourself, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, what I want us to notice is the difference between being in a situation where we have actually been asked to do that or we're actually doing that versus just, just hearing about it and having a kind of aversion or having an averse reaction to the very idea of helping people like that. Just sort of, it's something to, because it's something I noticed in myself when I first started reading these, I started noticing my reaction to just reading about this and a kind of aversion that I had to even the suggestions. And then I started looking at that and kind of wondering where exactly that aversion was coming from. Like, the idea, like this idea of like, no, everybody should has to suffer their own karma. And if that person doesn't suffer their own karma, they're never going to learn a lesson. And so it wouldn't be good for me to do that. But if you examine the impetus for why you might not want to do that, it might be more selfish than you think in that way. So it's just a, a suggestion to examine how you feel when you hear that a bodhisattva is, you know, it's suggested that a bodhisattva take up and sort of take on the suffering of others. Just kind of again, notice how you feel about hearing about that. And also then consider how you might actually think about doing that in that way. So. All right. Everybody doing okay? I have a question. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it just some just a thought that I think there are circumstances under which we we can imagine that kind of thing and be like, yeah, like for example, a parent and a child, like a parent you know sort of taking on the suffering of the child or protecting the child even at their own peril so it's not like outside of the realm of our experience but it's sort of on an edge and we we can i'm talking i should say i can relate to it within certain parameters so it, maybe like the challenge for me is like to expand what are those parameters why would why would i do that for my child but not for a stranger kind of thing Excellent. Perfect. Totally perfect, Noam. Exactly right. It, beautiful, too, in fact, because part of the Bodhisattva path 
is about, as they say in the sutras, the bodhisattva is working on viewing all sentient beings as being like either their children or their kin or their family. And so your analogy where we have this within us, or we could imagine situations where for certain people, we would be willing to do that. And then Noam's kind of uh, uh, inquiry or suggestion to possibly look at expanding that sphere. Excellent, excellent. All right, so in order to get to the Kashanti, let's keep going. So I did want to read, well, yeah, I did want to read a few more of these. So again, and again, what we're looking at is the kind of the heart and the soul, as it were, of the Bodhisattva, right? This very kind, very generous, very concerned about everyone's welfare kind of a person. Moreover, Kulaputra, when Bodhisattvas who practice upaya, when they pay homage to one Buddha with respect, making offerings, honoring, and praising, bodhisattvas will think all tathagatas share the same realm of dharmas, dharma dhatu, and the same dharma body, the same dharmakaya. They share the exact same discipline, the exact same meditation, li uh, wisdom, liberation, and the exact same knowledge and awareness that is derived from liberation. With this in mind, the bodhisattvas will know that to pay homage to one Buddha with respect, making offerings, honoring, and praising, is to do so to all Buddhas. For this reason, they can make offerings in this way to all the Buddhas in all the worlds of the Ten Directions. This is the upaya practiced by a bodhisattva. So this one's getting a little technical in that way. This introduces these kind of deeper ideas that we've talked about in Dharma Door's past, in particular talking about the Dharma Dhatu and the Dharma Kaya, the realm of dharmas and then the body of dharma. The basic idea, just to make this simple, because I don't want to get too derailed this evening, but the idea that is expressed here is, of course, all Buddhas, all Tathagatas, all thus come ones, share the same Dharmakaya, the same Dharma Dhatu. So they're all in the same realm. They're all in the same Dharma Dhatu, and they're all of the same Dharmakaya. In other words, there's a kind of a sense of what we would call non-duality. Again, I could get more technical about this, but I want to keep it simple. But it's this kind of what they're talking about here is that the Bodhisattva is mindful of the non-dual nature of the Tathagata, of a Buddha. The non-dual nature, meaning there's not two, and therefore there's not two dharmakayas there's not two dharma dhatus there is only one dharma dhatu because of this sense of the non-duality of buddhahood in that way so what this is talking about interestingly is that the bodhisattva here practicing upaya knowing that the Dharma body, knowing that the Dharmakaya is non-dual. Therefore, with that knowledge, the Bodhisattva knows that to make offerings to one Buddha is therefore to make offerings to all Buddhas because they all have the same one Dharmakaya. And so in that way, 
the bodhisattva sort of multiplies their offerings by this knowledge of the non-duality of the dharmakaya. So that's an interesting approach. And by the way, you can understand making offerings to a Buddha. You could understand that a number of different ways. Of course, in a more traditional Buddhist environment, that would sort of look like a altar or like a shrine where there's like a Buddha statue. And maybe it's the statue of Amitabha Buddha or Maitreya Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha with any number of the Buddhas. The Bodhisattva knows that to make offerings, like to bring an offering and make an offering to that statue image of the Buddha, would be making an offering to all Buddhas in that way. So you could think of it as an offering in that traditional sense of a temple shrine environment. But I would suggest also considering that the bodhisattva being aware of the non-dual nature of the real dharma kaya, the real dharma body of the Buddha, being aware of the non-dual nature of that dharmakaya, the bodhisattva therefore knows that making an offering to anyone is making an offering to the Buddha in that sense. Because if the bodhisattva is thinking, no, no, I'm making an offering to, to Jim, I'm making an offering to this person, that would be dualistic in that way. But with the Bodhisattva's knowledge of the non-dual nature of the Buddha, to make an offering to anyone in that sense is to make an offering to a Buddha. And to make offering to one Buddha, as the sutra tells us, is to make offerings to all Buddhas. So that one's getting a little esoteric there, I know. But And there's a way in which these are progressively getting a little more like kind of wild in a way. Let's move on. Furthermore, Kulaputra, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas who practice Upaya should not feel inferior if they are slow to learn. Even if they are conversant with only Four lines of verse, they should think. If one understands the meaning of just four lines of verse, they understand all the Buddha Dharma, because all Buddha Dharma are comprised in the meaning of these four lines. When they thoroughly know this, they will spare no effort to explain their four lines of verse to others widely out of kindness and compassion, whether they are in a city or in a village. They do so without seeking material gains, without seeking reputation or praise. And they vow, I will cause others to hear this four line stanza. And by this good root and this skillful vow, they will cause all sentient beings to be as well learned as Ananda and to acquire the eloquence of a Tathagata. This is the Upaya practiced by a Bodhisattva Mahasattva. <clears throat> so if you've read, if you've read a lot of sutras, the reference to just four lines of verse should sound familiar. It originally pops up in the Vajra Sutra, the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. That seems to be kind of the origin of this reference to just four lines of verse. But you may also... Um, you may also be familiar, there are some Zen stories about different uh, monks becoming enlightened from just hearing four lines of verse. 
So this is kind of a reference to that idea. It kind of has a, um, it has a deep correlation to the paragraph I just read, which is to say, in the same way that the Bodhisattva knows that to give an offering to one Buddha is to give offerings to all Buddhas. Well, so that's a reference to the Buddha. This is a reference to the Dharma, the teachings, but it's kind of the same idea, which is that four lines of verse contain the Dharma, and it's the same Dharma you're going to find in any four lines of verse. So any four lines of verse from a sutra in that way will contain the entirety of the teaching. And so even if a bodhisattva only knows four lines, that'll do. That's enough. And as it says at the beginning, and they shouldn't be ashamed if they're slow to learn, right? And of course, the bodhisattva knowing this four, line of, four lines of verse is very eager to share the wisdom with others because, of course, again, the Bodhisattva is very interested in all sentient beings' enlightenment in that way. All right. So I think, yeah, let me, I'm going to get to, I'm going to skip a few. I want to get to the Kashanti. So there's a few more of these. They also involve various acts of giving and then transferring the merit of that giving and all of that. So I'm going to skip a few down. This is the kind of the paragraph or the section that I really wanted to get to tonight. So furthermore, Kulaputra, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas who practice Upaya can cultivate all six paramitas while practicing just the one paramita of giving. How so? How could that be? Kulaputra. A bodhisattva who practices upaya will not be miserly, but will be generous when they see people begging. This, of course, is the paramita of giving. They themselves, the bodhisattva, they themselves keep the precepts and make offerings to those who keep the precepts. They persuade those who have broken the precepts to observe the precepts and then bestows offerings upon them for keeping the precepts. This is the paramita of discipline, sh shila. So again, what we're doing here is the bodhisattva is now practicing upaya by fulfilling all six paramitas all through the act of giving. <laughs> Fascinating right? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, they practice the paramita of giving by giving. And then here, they fulfill the paramita of shila, moral precepts, by making offerings to those who keep the precepts, right? So they're fulfilling the precepts by giving. And now, the bodhisattvas, they themselves are rid of hatred. They practice kindness and compassion, and with an undefiled mind, they benefit sentient beings by impartially giving to them all, or giving alms to them all. <clears throat> this is the paramita of kashanti, patience. Okay, so let me stop there because I now want to talk more about Kashanti patience. So right there, you we were given the 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 essence of Kashanti. What is this word? What is this all about? Right. Well, it's about not 
getting angry. That's what kashanti, patience, tolerance, patient tolerance. It's translated a bunch of different ways. But what it means is to be rid of hatred and to practice metta and karunya, loving kindness and compassion, right? And then, of course, in this section, they tie that in with the paramita of giving because, because the bodhisattva has no anger and is just practicing loving kindness and compassion, they give impartially to everyone. Right. So there you have your combination of kashanti and giving. But now I want to go deeper into talking about the practice of kashanti. So because this is a whole talk tonight about it, I want to mention a few things. This word Shanti. The root of it is Shanti. And you might know that word, the Sanskrit word Shanti, because it means peace, just peacefulness. Whereas Kashanti is this practice of peacefulness. So the kind of the practice of Shanti, if you will. And it's interesting because I'll tell you, I wanted to mention a little story. This is a little personal anecdote. So I, when I was in graduate school, so this was a long time ago, this would have been in the year 2001. I was in graduate school, but I was also working part-time and I was a, uh, like a, I was working uh, part-time in a law office in New York. I don't need to get into the details, but I wanted to kind of set a, 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 the environment in which this happened. So this is like a court big, one of those big law office, big corporate building, downtown New York. And I had been working there. And one of the uh, women I was working with happened to notice that like on my lunch break, I was reading a sutra or she, she didn't know quite what it was, but I think she, from the cover, she could tell it was a, a book about Buddhism. And so she asked me about it and I said, oh yeah, it's a, you know, I study Buddhism. I'm, get, I'm going to graduate school for Buddhist studies. And I'll never forget that, you know, here I am this kind of like, you know, nerd, egghead, like going to graduate school, studying Chinese, studying all this Buddhism. And this woman says, Buddhism, that's the peace religion, right? And it's so funny because I thought about it from when she said that. And it seemed at the time, like when I first heard it, it seemed like such a reduction in that way like because again here i am i'm like no it's about emptiness and it's about you know all these really high falutin philosophical concepts that i was kind of studying but when i heard her say that so simply oh buddhism that's the peace religion right i couldn't help but say yeah that's that's exactly right like talk about upaya what that woman said was upaya, that idea. But of course, you know, I think out in the world, Buddhism has a reputation for being about peacefulness. Like that's really what it's about. And I'm here to tell you that <laughs> that's what it's about. It's really deeply about peacefulness. Now that could be like inner peace, inner tranquility which of course would be the Hinayana. That would be the early form of Buddhism where it was about inner tranquility, inner peace and inner calm. As I, as I like to say, Mahayana Buddhism is the more socially engaged form of Buddhism. And so it's not just about internal peace, it's about world peace. For, for lack of a better term, it's about creating a peaceful world. And, you know, if you're into the Buddhist tradition, 
what they call that is creating a pure land, creating a purified Buddha realm. They have all these fancy terms and fancy ideas and ways of talking about it. But what they're talking about is making the world a more peaceful place. And that functions both internally as far as a more peaceful mind, a more peaceful heart, more peaceful being, but then also practices and a genuine concern about making the world a more peaceful place. And there is, of course, a number of different ways to do that. But I would suggest that this practice of kashanti, this practice of patience, that is the peacefulness in that way. That is really kind of the heart of this, this teaching of peace. And so the teaching, again, not to get it confused, this word patience, I don't know if, if you're like me, when I hear patience, I instantly think of being in a very long line. <laughs> <laughs> and basically the idea of patiently waiting. <laughs> and that's unfortunate because that is not really exactly what Kashanti is all about. Again, Kashanti is all about not being angry. But the practice of Kashanti, the practice of Kashanti is really, in a way, about being confronted with what would otherwise make you angry <laughs> and being patient, being peaceful. So, that's sort of what Kashanti is about, is about being peaceful in the face of opposition, in the face of these challenging, of, of the challenges of the world in that sense, right? So because I'm kind of doing this Upaya thing, this series on Upaya, I want to share another personal uh I, I don't none of these were planned by the way but they just keep popping to mind <laughs> i i want to share um another personal example of kashanti and this was an interesting one because it, i i um i sort of learned this one the hard way so to speak <laughs> so i had this thing in New York. So I lived in New York for a long time. Like I said, I went to school out there, graduate school out there. And I lived in, in Manhattan for a number of years. And the whole time I lived in, in New York, altogether, probably a decade or so, I had the misfortune of being struck randomly several times. <laughs> You know, it's New York, it's a big city, it's a tough place and all of that. But these particular instances of either one was just walking down the street, I was walking down Fifth Avenue one day and just got sucker punched, boom, hard by somebody walking by. Okay, happens. But the one I want to tell you about is this particular moment because it was really, for me personally, uh, enlightening in that way. So I was teaching at uh, Hunter College in New York, but I was living in Brooklyn at the time. So I was on the train and I was on the train going into Manhattan, going up to Hunter College. On the train, I was sitting in one side of the, of the train reading my sutra. I was literally reading a sutra, getting ready to teach a class. And, you know, and when I taught uh, at university, I would, I would dress the part. So I had a little tie on my little collared shirt. So I really, of course, looked quite nerdy <laughs> with my glasses and my little collar and tie in the corner reading my little book. All right. 
So I'm over there. And then on the other side of the train was a group of young men. And I could tell that they were looking at me and sort of, you know, something was up, right? And then we pulled into, I think it was still in Brooklyn. I think it was the Hoyt Schimmerhorn stop in Brooklyn. And the car doors open and the group of kids got out of the train and were walking on the platform. I was in down at this end of the car. And right before the doors closed, one of the kids, whoop, ow, like punched me hard. My glasses go flying. My suture goes flying on the ground. And then, of course, the doors close. And I stand up and I'm at the window and they're laughing and off they go, right? And it gave me a moment to reflect. And I suppose it was because of the situation, which was that the, the subway doors closed. And so there's really nothing that I could do, right? And what I mean is, is that I, of course, noticed that I got angry. I got angry because I had been struck in that way. But the the focus or like where, where I wanted to place my anger, which was the person who struck me, they weren't around. They, they, the, the doors closed, the train had gone. So I couldn't direct it at the person where the anger wanted to go in that way. And so I was really just left with it, my own anger in that sense. And when I looked at it, I realized some things and I can't really say how I came to this conclusion. It was really just something that I, I, I just understood intuitively. And what it was, was that I, I realized that if you, if, if, if you're going to randomly strike a stranger, like if you, if you, if someone has the heart and the mentality to violently punch someone randomly, they must have a lot of anger. And what I realized was that that person's anger, they gave it to me. They gave it to me, all right. But they literally gave me the anger and I was left with it. And I realized that the next logical thing for me to do was to pass the anger on. And that's when I realized, oh, I can make this anger stop now. And I did. And it was so liberating. It was liberating not to hold it. It was liberating not to harbor that animosity towards that person. It was liberating to have the compassion to recognize that that person must be suffering. That anger must be coming from a really deep place of suffering. And so that kid, that person, they, they in a way need my loving kindness much more than they need me to give them anger back because they're probably getting enough anger in their life to begin with. And that's why they've got so much of it. They're ready to share it with me. And again, that's when I realized, oh, I can just make this anger, which maybe it's that person's anger, maybe it's my own anger. I could just make it go away. And I did. And again, it was fully liberating. It was not in any way repressive. It wasn't repression of anger because I literally felt compassion for this person. So I just didn't have the anger anymore. And for me, that was my first real look at Kashanti. 
at how it actually like works. And what I when I say work, I mean it societally really works in that sense, that it it helps the problem a lot to be patient. And in particular, to be lovingly kind and compassionate, even towards those who are being angry or antagonistic towards us. And again, to the theme of this series, the theme of the talk tonight is about skillful patience. And so the idea is, is that yes, we can be patient, we can be tolerant, meaning, you know, we can um, take a deep breath, we can, you know, okay, okay, <sighs> breathe, breathe, like I calm down, calm down. There's one way to be patient, which is that kind of reminding yourself to be patient and 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 doing it but there's this kind of skillful way of being patient where again you realize it's beneficial that it's beneficial to yourself your own heart your stomach your mind your it's beneficial to yourself and of course it's beneficial to others in that way so Again, to wrap this up, the bodhisattva is then patient, but from this place of wisdom. And I'm so, I know I already said this a minute ago, but I really want to repeat it. I am so, like, I really want to teach this form of kashanti, which is the wise, liberating form, because I know that there can be the risk of repression. Like there is a risk of this, like, like, oh, I should be a good Buddhist and not get angry. And therefore, like kind of, you know, this person, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's my spouse, maybe it's my parents, maybe it's my children, but whoever it is, there's a way that they can maybe make us angry. And then we might go like, okay just stuff that down, like don't get angry at them. And while it is good to, you know, exercise self-control in that way and not get angry, I'm really kind of advocating this form of kashanti where we recognize, again, how detrimental anger is, right? All right, any questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that? Cool, then I'll say a couple more words then. Another angle Yep, great comment there. So another aspect about anger and Kashanti that I want to mention is this. It kind of is going to pertain a little bit to some things I was saying last week. So last week, when I went and talked about the precepts, this idea of like being prone to violence, maybe uh, certainly being prone to sexuality, being prone to various things. Last week, I talked about how for the most part, Buddhism recognizes that it's kind of built in to the, um, it's definitely built into the, like the mammalian species. In fact, it's built into a lot of creatures. It's a conditioned part of our biology to get angry. It's a, it's biological to kind of defend ourselves and like, Argh! bare our teeth, growl, which is to say yell. So it's a part of that. And so when we're observing the precepts, when I talked about last week was Buddhism recognizes that we are kind of prone to these things and therefore it requires self-control and discipline to not do them. And to kind of, in the words of Buddhism, to go against the stream of those conditioned behaviors. 
Well, I want to talk a little bit about the conditioned behavior of anger. So the idea here is, is that if you really kind of start to look at anger, there's an unfortunate part of growing up. <laughs> and what I'm thinking about, what I'm imagining is when we are babies, if we get hungry or our diaper needs changing, we start yelling and we start screaming and we don't really stop screaming and yelling until we get what we want. And the point is, is that as babies, we are conditioned to basically start screaming and yelling when we're dissatisfied and when we want something. And it's kind of unfortunate that we are rewarded for such behavior by being given milk, by being given toys, by being given things in response to our screaming and yelling. Now, I know that this is, you know, it's tricky. And I'm not suggesting that we change the way we raise children. I'm not suggesting some stoic form of child raising where we, you know, condition the child to, you know, not scream and yell and all of that. It, it's not about that. It's about the fact that when we're babies, that's how it works because we don't have words, we don't have language. So the only thing we can do is scream and yell. And then our parents reward us with the milk or whatever it is. The problem, though, is when we grow up and we're still screaming and yelling when we don't get what we want. <laughs> and or we're still expecting to get what we want from screaming and yelling. And what's really unfortunate about that conditioned behavior of getting angry when we don't get what we want, what's really unfortunate about it is that if I get angry because I haven't gotten what I wanted, sometimes then the only thing I know how to do is to then get more angry. Because <laughs> then that, that's got to do it, right? Well, maybe if I get super crazy angry, maybe that'll do it. And so the point is, is that while our parents <laughs> loved us in that way and were willing to put up with our screaming and yelling in order to give us that, the rest of society does not work that way. But again, if we have been conditioned to try to get what we want by screaming and yelling and getting angry in that way and pouting, all of these conditioned behaviors from childhood, it often, again, it doesn't go very well in the adult societal wor world. But again, if it's all you know how to do, then you might double down on it. What I'm getting to, or what I'm trying to talk about, again, is the wise approach to Kashanti, the wise approach to not being angry. And what I mean is, I know that for me, my own personal practice is to really examine my anger and to really examine it in terms of the Dharma, by which I mean, what, if, what do I feel like I'm not getting right? What do I want that I'm being deprived of? What is the dukkha that is being caused by this craving that I'm responding to with anger in that way? So for me, my personal practice is to use moments when I'm getting angry as an opportunity to explore my own conditioning in that way and my own conditioned behaviors. So that also, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, let me remind you or tell you the general basic practice of Buddhism, like the super general basic practice, is this 
two part practice of calming or stopping and seeing or vipassana, shamatha and vipassana, stopping or calming and seeing. And I want to kind of mention this because I know that normally shamatha is taught as like meditation, like dim, dim the lights, light some incense, uh, go to the zendo and practice shamatha, like practice that. So I know that normally it's like a session of meditation, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something happens and you notice that you're getting angry in that moment we basically have two choices and one of them actually isn't even a choice but where there's two kind of options we can go along with that anger and basically get more angry and you know if somebody has made me angry and i notice the anger coming up well one option is to let them know that i'm angry one option is to let the anger out and then that'll really really get this anger ball going or i can stop and notice that I am angry. Like I can notice that it is happening. And as simple as this seems, it is the stopping and noticing. This is the shamatha. It is the stopping and the noticing that I am now angry that allows for us to break the cycle of it continuing. If we don't do that initial step of stopping and noticing, it will just snowball into an argument. It will just snowball into restless sleep. It'll just snowball into all of that. So the practice is to stop and notice. And what I particularly like about the Buddhist approach to this of stopping and noticing is again, it's not repressing. We are not getting rid of it. We are actually staring at it right in its kind of face, as it were. So we're not repressing it, but we're not allowing it to grow. We're just kind of arresting it, if you will, stopping it to examine it and asking, where is this anger coming from? from whence this anger why this anger and what happens is, is and by the way that is the vipassana so the vipassana is asking from whence this anger why so it begins by stopping and noticing and then asking the question of why and this basically i say this often uh, other places but this is where Vipassana is basically like self-analysis, doing therapy on yourself, where you're asking yourself the question, where's that coming from? So, you know, an example that I give a lot is, you know, something really simple, but something to think about. So I love coffee in the morning. If you're like me, you love coffee in the morning. So there's nothing worse than waking up in the morning and being out of coffee. It's the <laughs> worst, right? So the idea here is, is that when that happens, anger could arise. And, and let's say and now I'm going to get a little personal, of course, but again, I'm trying to do more of that in this Upaya series. So let's say you live with someone. Let's just say you live with somebody. And let's say it's the other person that you live with. Let's say it's, it's their responsibility, but it's an ag agreed upon responsibility, but it's their responsibility to buy the coffee. Let's just say. So now 
You wake up one morning and there's no coffee. Anger, <laughs> dis disappointment, frustration, right? Now, it could very easily happen then that we get angry at the person that didn't buy the coffee. I think maybe you could imagine this happening. <laughs> now, the idea here is, is that I wake up in the morning, there's no coffee, here comes the anger, and I'm instantly, of course, looking for who to blame. Who can I blame for this? Oh, it was their responsibility to buy the coffee. They didn't buy it. So now I'm going to get angry at them. And then as soon as I see them, why didn't you buy the coffee? You ruined my whole day. Yada, yada, yada. Now, and now, why do I always have to buy the coffee? Da, da. And now we're in this crazy argument. And that's what I mean by it's snowballing. Now, had I woken up in the morning and saw that there's no coffee and was not happy about that, upset about that, and the anger arose, if I had it, if I had it in me, I would do the practice and I would stop and notice this whole no coffee situation is making me angry. But why? And then you could actually look deeper and realize, oh, I'm not getting what I want. I want coffee, but I'm not getting what I want. That's why I'm angry. I'm not actually angry at the other person for not buying coffee. That's not actually why I'm angry. I'm angry because I'm not getting what I want. And that's the Dharma. <laughs> that's the teaching is that we get upset when we don't get what we want. And the point is, is that if I analyze this anger honestly, I realize that I'm causing myself the anger. Literally because I'm wanting something that I can't have. And you guess what wisdom tells me? Or guess what wisdom reminds me? Wisdom reminds me that I could yell and scream at my spouse till the cows come home and there still wouldn't be any coffee. So I'm still not going to, quote, get what I want. So then what's the point of all the yelling and the screaming and the fighting and all of that? For me personally, in this, this situation, which has happened, it's about being very honest with myself about where the anger is coming from and not being, uh, not displacing it. In other words, I, I believe that's what they call it, right? When we displace anger and say, oh no, it's your fault when it's not in that way. So that's my kind of spiel about Kishanti in that sense, that we could approach it just as a good practice, just calming down is a good thing. Or we could approach it as from the perspective of wisdom and realize that, again, it's really detrimental to ourselves, the anger. But I am not suggesting to repress it. I'm suggesting analyzing where it comes from and in a way undoing what's causing it in that sense. So, all right, I'm going to pause there for this evening. Uh, obviously, there's more of the sutra. And next week, we are going to talk about uh, virya, talk about determination, but skillful determination. So, Unless anybody has any last thoughts, comments, ideas about Kashanti. Awesome comments. I don't think I missed anybody's question. Hopefully I didn't. All right. Gnome, I'm going to pass it off to you.